Hey, what's up everyone? Alyssa Knight here. Good morning. For those of you who are coming in on YouTube, uh, I am just setting up my different streams here. Uh, bear with me. This is my first time using Riverside. Uh, so give me one second while I make sure that we are live on all of the platforms. Give me one second. Okay. Just waiting on LinkedIn Live here. For some reason, LinkedIn is not wanting to go live. All right, um, I don't know why this isn't working, but you know what, that's okay. We'll just uh, go live on YouTube. So good morning, everyone. Uh, hope everyone is having a great day so far. So uh, I'm Melissa Knight. Uh, welcome to the Nightlight YouTube channel. This is a channel that's dedicated to gear and software reviews from pre to post production. Um, we've got some videos up. We just launched this channel. Uh, we do have other channels like Night TV Plus, um, as well as the Alyssa Knight Archives for those of you um, who come from the cybersecurity community. All of my historical cybersecurity videos and hacking videos are on that channel. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Uh, we're here to talk about screenwriting. Uh, the reason why I wanted to put this video together was um, I wanted to cull all of the knowledge that I've gleaned over uh, the different screenplays that I've written uh, for television and the TV series it, and franchises at Night Studios. Um, I have traditionally uh, built my um, formulaic approach, if you will, to writing screenplays using Save the Cat. Um, there are different versions of Save the Cat that have been adapted to writing novels, uh, writing TV shows. So uh, we'll go over that today. But I'm going to be covering the 15 beats or three act structure of screenplays in this live stream today. Uh, I'm also going to answer any questions. I have Mel here who's going to be uh, producing the show and covering any Q and A in the different chat uh, in the different chat messages that come in. Um, so definitely uh, post your questions to chat. Mel is monitoring YouTube chat right now. So again, because of the problems in uh, getting the live stream working on LinkedIn and Twitter uh, and the different places that we're supposedly supposed to be uh, syndicating to. Um, we couldn't get that working, so we're only monitoring YouTube. So I'm going to be talking about character development in the next video. Today is really just around sort of the formulaic structure of Save the Cat, what it means, the importance of the hero's journey. We'll talk about that um, and the monomyth. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I guess let's just go ahead and get started. Again, post your questions to chat. Mill will be monitoring for questions there and comments. And uh, hope you uh, enjoy the stream. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so I've had a bit of experience in, in writing screenplays. Uh, these are the different episodes that I've written all the screenplays for. Uh, some of our franchises, including Ransom and Dark Ops, uh, I wrote all of the screenplays for those shows. Um, so going through that, as well as reading a lot of the books uh, and taking a lot of the training uh, courses that are available out there in writing screenplays, one of the things that uh, I'm a big proponent of is always to tell all of you, don't just listen to one person's training course or don't listen to just one person. Uh, get ideas, get education from different people and take the best of all of that training from each individual uh, place that you go to or live streams like this or webinars or videos out there on YouTube for YouTube University. 
and come up with something that works for you that makes sense for you as long as you're following that that basic structure i know that a lot of people it's a, a religious debate on save the cat uh, there's a lot of history of for and against with save the cat as far as making screenplays too formulaic um it's it's important to understand that the 15 beats and save the cat uh, while it is formulaic, really help you to drive the story forward and the character arc forward. So those are incredibly important lest you write a screenplay that really doesn't have that that standard sort of um, journey, if you will, hero's journey that everyone is so used to. Um, you know, there's some things where, you know, you'll watch a movie or watch a show um, that really doesn't hit on those points uh, when it's expected by the audience. And then the takeaway is, you know what, I, I really can't put my finger on it, but I just really thought that show was bad or that movie was bad. Um, and a lot of the times it's it's really just because of those missing beats, um, among other things. But uh, so that's why, especially if you're starting out in writing screenplays, uh, that you really try and understand what are the different structures out there for telling stories. Now, obviously, storytelling can be applied to pretty much everything. Just as just why that Save the Cat has been, um, and hopefully you can all see my screen. Everything's good. Um, awesome. So, you know, here's the thing about Save the Cat. Because storytelling is pretty much in everything we do, you know, you've heard me say this about sales, that, uh, you know, Apple... Uh, the reason why they're so successful is they don't tell us what the iPhone is, they tell us why we need it. And so I'm a big believer in that, that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So, you know, here's the thing with storytelling, it can be adapted to everything, which is why Save the Cat has been uh, rewritten for so many different approaches to storytelling, from the original Save the Cat to all of the different versions that came after that, including Rights for TV written by Jamie Nash. I did take training from Jamie Nash on that. Because TV series are so different from a, a 90 minute, you know, or two hour, two and a half hour film, uh, feature film, it, you need to approach those beats in a different way. Whereas, you know, on a, maybe you have a 45 minute, you know, one hour or a 30 minute TV show, um, it's really difficult, arguably, to hit all of those beats in a single 30-minute TV show. So a book was written uh, by Jamie Nash that takes the concepts, uh, the idea behind STC, or Save the Cat, and applies it to a season-long show. Um, and obviously the number of episodes will differ um, from production to production, but you know it, it takes that formulaic approach to uh, writing screenplays and helps you write a better TV series. So I'm gonna go a little bit into the history of Save the Cat as well as the three act structure. So as I mentioned, it's been rewritten for different types of work of authorship. It's even used for writing novels. So you know, it's, it's really interesting to me and I'm, I'm very passionate about Save the Cat. You guys and girls out there have um, uh, all heard me talk about this. Uh, it's it's uh, for me makes the most sense as far as trying to structure your story. Uh, it is based on the monomyth or the hero's journey. Now I'm going to talk about that in the next slide here uh, on what the hero's journey is. But just understand that the hero's journey uh, is basically this idea that your your protagonist in your story is going to go on an adventure. Right? Um, there's some sort of inciting incident. Uh, and it's funny because we'll we'll cover this in the next slide, but so many of my analogies uh, and anecdotes that you'll hear me talk about in this relate to the Matrix, because the Matrix really maps so easily to the 15 beats in, in Save the Cat uh, and the three-act structure as well as the monomyth. And so um, I'm going to talk about that to help you better understand what these beats mean. And that's really what this is all about, right? I, a lot of you can go out there and Google this and read it on your own. But I want to try and demystify a lot of what may be kind of difficult for you to understand or what's expected for these different beats 
um, and explain it in a way that might be a little bit more digestible, a little bit more, um, that might make a little bit more sense. Uh, so the original author, uh, and I apologize, that's a typo, not Blade Snyder, but Blake Snyder, um, was the original author of Save the Cat. He lived from 1957 and passed away in 2009. And a lot of people, as you see on the right-hand side for, and, and by the way, there's a lot more than this. This is just four of the examples that I pulled off of Google Images. Uh, there's other versions of Save the Cat, like Save the Cat Goes to the Movies. Um, so here's the thing about Blake Snyder is, you know, the original Save the Cat was built around this, the uh, a feature-length film, uh, typically around 90 to 120 pages. Uh, and we'll talk about that as well. But um, it was originally authored by Blake Snyder, and many people have kind of carried that torch along uh, since his passing. So Blake Snyder Enterprises, I think, I want to say that it was renamed um, since uh, his passing, uh, and it's really around the Save the Cat franchise uh, incorporation, where they've got software, there's a mobile app, there's these things, these document tools, the software that will actually help guide you along and writing screenplay. Now, here's the thing. I always love giving away free tools, especially document tools. And I created a worksheet in Google Docs for all of you for free. And it's going to be on the last slide just to make sure you sit through this live stream. Um, there's a link to it. And I want to say, I think it's up to about eight pages now, um, eight to 10 pages. And it is the entire Save the Cat structure. And I actually put in notes from all of the books into this worksheet to help guide you in actually filling out this beat sheet before you get to actually writing your screenplay. Again, the beat sheet and filling out these different beats and understanding what's going to happen at that beat is not your screenplay. All right. Think of this again from my analogy, uh, my quote from Abraham Lincoln, it's like sharpening your ax, right? Before you actually go into actually trying to cut down the tree or write that screenplay. Um, so the the history of Save the Cat or the name behind it, uh, it may be an odd name to all of you, but Save the Cat and the, the name actually was derived from the decisive moment that heroes uh, become worth rooting for. Uh, what does that mean? Meaning that in order to really hook your audience and make your audience actually like your your film or your motion picture, your, your TV show, whatever it is, you they, they need to become uh, emotionally invested in that hero, right? Um, a lot of you have probably sat there with your, your significant other, your partner, watching a show and you'll see a character on that show. They're not a bad person, but their character is. And you're just like, oh, I hate that character. I hate that character. But in real life, you know, this actor who's playing that character may be like the sweetest, loveliest person in the world, but you just hate that character, right? Um, vice versa, you could be watching a show and you may just fall in love with the protagonist, uh, the hero of the story, whether it's Neo and the Matrix or, you know, uh, Jack Ryan in that uh, Jack Ryan series on Amazon Prime. Uh, you, you, you become emotionally invested with that character and you want to come back show after show after show to find out what is happening to that hero, what is happening to that character throughout the season or throughout the film um, or franchise, whatever it may be. Uh, the three X structure is uh, basically divided into three parts, right? It divides a story into three parts. The three parts are called the setup, the confrontation, and the resolution. Um, and uh, this was originally coined and documented uh, by a gentleman named Sid Fried in 1979, the year I was born. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, basically divides the story into these three expected, um, maybe at a subconscious level by the audience, uh, but these three sort of phases of a story. Uh, and these basically correspond to the beginning, the middle, and the end, or the cause and effect. So there's some sort of cause that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, an inciting incident where the hero is forced to make a decision, right? In the case of Neo in The Matrix, it was uh, making the decision to go out of the building window, 
right? Which he wasn't uh, psychologically, emotionally ready to to make that sort of leap where someone was telling him to scale the side of a building and we'll, we find out that uh, that is, um, oh, what's his name? Morpheus, thank you, <laughs> Morpheus, um, you know, calling him and telling him what to do, uh, and he just wasn't ready to make that leap. So there's this inciting incident where the hero has to make a decision and then ultimately take that red pill uh, in the case of the Matrix. So let's talk about the hero's journey. All right, the hero's journey really uh, starts out with a call to adventure, right? Um, we start to kind of see this lead up to it, um, where you know Neo was invited to the club by his client, um, it, it was uh, the impetus to that was um, the text messages he was getting on his computer screen saying "follow the white rabbit," and you see him look at the tattoo on the woman uh, standing at his door who has a white rabbit tattoo. Right? There's some sort of call to adventure, or you know something happens. Uh, they meet their mentor, right? This is typically someone that's going to guide them along in their journey. It's this buddy love um, sort of person where, you know, or either a bromance or anything else that just someone who's going to ultimately guide them along the way. Um, then they sort of make this decision to go from the, the um, status quo, right? The normal world of where they are now and then venture into this unknown world which is ultimately the hero's journey and their decision to actually cross that threshold and go on that journey. And in the Matrix, that was ultimately Neo taking that red pill. Um, your hero will go through a series of tri trials and failures, um, and there's some sort of helper or someone along the way that just kind of helps that person uh, through that journey. Now, this, you know, you could argue that this was pro probably Trinity. Uh, in, in the Matrix uh, versus Morpheus, whereas Morpheus was sort of more of the mentor in the Matrix and Trinity was more of that helper who he ultimately uh, develops a, a romantic relationship with. Um, there's some sort of growth here where the hero is starting to acquire new skills or sort of learn from their inner demons or, or just sort of grow, right? So the most important thing is you're figuring out who your hero is. Um, and I ran into this challenge where I actually talked to uh, Jamie Nash about this, where in the Dark Ops franchise, it was really difficult for me um, to figure out who within a team of people is ultimately your hero, because you can really only have one protagonist. So there's situations where there might be more than one, but traditionally there's usually only one protagonist. Now, the answer to this, if all of you are sort of struggling with who is my hero uh, in my story, you need to think about the fact that the hero is the person who has the furthest distance to go. They have the most trauma to overcome, um, some sort of inner, um, something that's broken at maybe at a very visceral level with that hero um, where they have to go through the most growth. That is your protagonist. And this is something I really struggled with with the Dark Ops franchise um, where originally started out with one individual who ended up leaving the team. Uh, so then trying to find a new protagonist, but we had two really strong characters on the team. Um, but again, it's trying to figure out who within that team of people really has the most growth to uh, and, and demons to overcome. Uh, there's sort of this death and rebirth of this hero where um, the old hero sort of dies the old them dies and then they're born again is this, you know, amazing new uh, improved version of themselves. Uh, and this happened with Neo and the Matrix, right? Where, um, you know, he unplugged from the Matrix and realized that there was a separate reality um, outside of the Matrix that the Matrix itself, the world he thought before was the world or reality was in fact uh, artificial. It was in fact synthetic. Um, so there's sort of this death and rebirth of that hero uh, that they need to go through. Now, this doesn't necessarily need to mean, Alyssa, are you telling me that my hero needs to literally die? No, 
um, this is just the pivotal moment in your story where that hero just sort of becomes this awakened uh, new person uh, with a new view on life and, and what they thought their life was or who they were before. So it's sort of this revelation is the next one. And then the the hero really ultimately finally changes at this point. There's atonement, right? Um, the hero atones for, um, you know, maybe uh, a past sin or, or a change in some way. They, they undergo that transformation. Uh, and in that process of finally changing, we see our hero get a, their gift, right? Their, their ultimate prize for crossing the finish line of becoming this new version of themselves. In Matrix, we see it as Neo sort of developing these, these superpowers where he can fly, um, where he can leap tall buildings uh, and not be Spider-Man, right? Um, but ultimately, you see this hero sort of achieve or get this gift. And here's the thing. If you look at, like, for example, Top Gun uh, Maverick, if you look at things like Avatar, you can pretty much take this hero's journey and apply it to really any film and uh, uh, find the protagonist based on this hero's journey uh, structure. While formulaic, it, it, it is a process that really is repeated, rinsed, and reused a lot in Hollywood. And it's because it's really the way we as an audience have become accustomed to watching movies or watching TV shows is some sort of journey. Otherwise, it's boring, right? Um, you you see uh, in over the history of time, some of you can probably think about it where, you know, um, you were watching something and you just had to turn it off. Uh, it was boring. It was, you know, you'll hear people refer to it as, oh, the, the it's really slow in the beginning, but you just got to hang on. A lot of the times that's because the uh, person who wrote the screenplay, the screenwriter, didn't hit those beats at the correct point. And what you'll see here shortly is there are specific pages when you're supposed to hit those beats, all right? And so when you hear someone tell you, oh, the, this is so slow, get to the point, it's because a lot of the times those screenplays didn't hit those beats at the right time. So after they get their gift, the hero basically returns changed back to their, their world. Um, they have this new outlook on life. They have these new superpowers. Um, and it, maybe the change uh, with Spider-Man is a lot more than just um, uh, him getting bitten by the spider, right? Maybe, maybe it's the fact that, um, you know, before he was sort of this nerdy kind of kid who was picked on and then all of a sudden with his new superpowers now um you know he's he's no longer the one being bullied and he feels um emboldened and stronger uh because of his new powers so really it's it's making sure that within your story your hero is going through some sort of transformation so let's talk about the three x structure um, there really is a setup, a confrontation, and a resolution. We talked a little bit about this before, where there's a beginning, a midpoint. Um, and it's really important that you follow sort of this rising action, is what you'll sometimes hear it referred to as. But it's this slope where um, you sort of have this beginning. I mentioned this earlier, an inciting incident. Uh, the hero has to go through some sort of decision matrix, right? Um, no pun intended with matrix, but, uh, you know, Neo was for, was given this decision by Morpheus. Morpheus said, blue pill, you go back to the way things were, or red pill, you find out what the matrix really is. And Neo takes the red pill. So it's really important that you bring your audience along that journey where um, your hero is faced with some kind of dilemma or decision on what to do. And that really will is what brings your audience in and becomes emotionally invested uh, in this in this process. Um, are we we're good? We're live on LinkedIn as well. Oh, okay. Uh, what's the question?
Yeah, so uh, that's a great point. Um, y what you'll see, thanks, Devin. Uh, by the way, it's good to see you. Um, we do have some actors from the cast of Dark Ops here this morning, so uh, welcome. Thank you so much for attending. Um, and crew as well. Um, so uh, great question, Devin. Yeah, y it is, again, there's this formulaic sort of structure where you're – um, your hero is introduced. They don't have to necessarily be introduced uh, in the opening scene, but you know the opening scene, the beginning, which you'll see here shortly. Uh, the opening image is what it's called in Save the Cat. Uh, it is a there, there is a an expected sort of hooking your audience in right away. Um, and uh, but no, it, it you don't need to immediately introduce your hero. Um, just remember again that. Your hero among a team of people, among a cast of people, and the, it's you'll. I, I guarantee you'll never write a script where there's there's just one person. There's you've got your supporting characters, uh, you've got your lead characters, but you know. So it may be challenging where you you as the screenwriter become so emotionally invested, um, you fall in love with these characters. You know, you'll hear screenwriters say, "Oh, this is the best character ever written in history." Um, you you sort of develop this relationship with these characters where it becomes very difficult for you to figure out who you want to be the protagonist, you know, who you want to be the hero. Um, so it's super important that um, you make sure that you, whoever, whatever the protagonist that you choose has the most um, compelling uh, sort of journey to go through or overcome the most compelling demons, the most broken, fractured person uh, in your story uh, that needs to overcome uh, these odds. Uh, so it's it it choosing your your protagonist is incredibly important. Ooh, uh, that's a great point, Devin. Um, so. You ha clearly have your protagonist and you have your antagonist in stories, right? Um, there can be uh, an overall arc. Sorry, my my um, teleprompter is messing up here. Um, you do have an arc where, yes, uh, you know, it may seem like, uh, and by the way, Cobra Kai sort of did the same thing um, where you thought that Daniel was the one who was bullied growing up when in fact it may have actually been uh, the opposite where Daniel was the bully. Um, but um, regarding Star Wars, uh, yes, Darth Vader was definitely the antagonist. And you you have different antagonists that are introduced along the series. As a matter of fact, Mel and I are going through it. We're watching it. We're doing a Star Wars marathon right now where we're watching all the Star Wars in chronological order. Um, but you do have different antagonists that come along. But for sure, even though you see someone like Darth Vader, who in the end, you know, shows affection, shows love for Luke um, and what he did ultimately in the end, um, even though the antagonist went through that journey or went through that change or metamorphosis, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not the antagonist anymore. Um Characters can go through uh, a, a character arc. As a matter of fact, you want them to, uh, in in order for people to to sort of your audience to fall in love with these characters. You'll see this where you know um, Mel and I, for example, will be watching a show, and I'll like one particular character. Mel will hate that character, and she'll like someone else on the show. People will become emotionally invested in the characters that you write because they're most like them. Right. And and you'll hear screenwriters talk about this, that it's really important that when you write characters, you they have, especially your protagonists, they have a quality about them that your audience can relate to. They should be relatable. They should be a challenge that um, you, someone in your audience might understand and sympathize with. Um, you know, maybe it's that that woman who's battered by her husband. Maybe there's someone in the audience that has gone through that, right? Um, who was it? Jennifer Lopez did that movie enough, right? Uh, now, while there may not be uh, aspects like women in the audience that weren't battered, maybe there are elements of J-Lo's personality, her character of being strong and and not taking any more BS um, and really just 
no longer being the victim um, where there were women or possibly even men um, and everyone in between in the audience that that related to that. That was like, hey, look, you know what? I'm no longer going to be bullied at work by this person. I'm not no longer going to be, I'm going to, I'm not going to be the victim anymore. That is a relatable um, aspect of the character's, um, character's arc. Okay. So, uh, great questions, uh, Devin. So, okay. So, so, so there's a deciding incident. Then there's sort of the second thought where the, the protagonist has to make a decision. Uh, the protagonist is then at the plot point one sort of faced with these obstacles or subplots. It's really important that your story have subplots. Uh, I can't stress this enough. You really don't want a flat um, story arc where you really only have one A story. You always sort of want this B story, whether that's a romance or a bromance. Um, it could be anything, but you want sort of a, a, a B story. And we'll talk about that here shortly, but you want these subplots going on as well. Um, you'll see this in cr procedural crime dramas, uh, something that we at Night Studios are are very focused in developing. It's pretty much all we produce are procedural crime dramas. Um, but you'll see this very common in procedural dramas where uh, there may be multiple cases that an, an FBI team is investigating or uh, you know, or if you watch Chicago PD, you'll see in Chicago PD sometimes there'll be multiple cases going on or there'll be a main case going on and someone is struggling on the team with something going on in their personal life. Um, you always want subplots and obstacles in your story. Uh, then you get to your midpoint. This is sort of the big twist. Um, your midpoint in your story is sort of this, as the uh, hero is going on their journey, they're going up this arc, there's this sort of culmination of events that happens where there's some sort of huge twist in the story um, that just knocks your audience off their socks and just comes out of left field that the audience wasn't expecting to happen. Um, so this is your, your midpoint. Then you have more obstacles and subplots, and then you have your disaster and crisis uh, at the top of plot point two, and then a descending action and obstacles and ultimately a climax and wrap up. You need, and I can't stress this enough, and especially in uh, the three act structure, um, which Save the Cat is based on, um, you need to deliver to your audience what they're expecting. Um, you'll see in some movies where people will walk away and say, God damn it, that ending sucked. I hated that ending um, or no ending at all. Uh, but ultimately, even if it's a franchise and there's multiple, um, you know, multiple episodes or there's multiple movies in that franchise, you you ultimately still deliver to the audience what they've emotionally invested into watching are expecting to deliver and uh, be delivered. And so uh, that's really important. Uh, a lot of times you'll see in movies the it will be the end scene mirroring the opening scene uh, do did any of you watch that movie swordfish um it was with hugh jackman uh, about a hacker who was forced to um, do these illegal acts and um if you notice that's a perfect example of the opening image mirroring uh the the ending image or the the end of the movie uh, they started out at the end um, and ultimately, uh, they were just a mirror image of each other. This is very common uh, in screenwriting uh, in Hollywood. Okay, so let's talk about understanding the very basic tenets of screenwriting. Screenwriting is, uh, like I said, very structured. It's very formulaic. It's a form of writing that forms the blueprint of your film or TV show. I want all of you to think about the screenplay as the foundation of your house that you're building on. And ultimately below that foundation is your beat sheet. But you know, it is the it is a structured form of writing that follows a specific format. Uh, you don't want to go into Microsoft Word and just start typing dialogue and scene descriptions um, without any sort of expected format and then try and option that script. And we will talk about optioning scripts on this channel, I promise, um, because it is a very common question that I get is how do I get my script optioned? Um, but you can't write a um, you, you can't just go in there and create your own format for a screenplay and say, well, you know what, um, in a very arrogant way, I'm developing a new format for my for screenplays and this is uh, the way I'm going to write them. 
you're not going to get that script option. I guarantee you it's, it's it, the scripts, um, whether it's an agent, uh, a buyer, whatever, they're going to expect that that screenplay to be written in a specific format. Um, it is different from other forms of writing because it's highly structured. Um, there's expected formatting uh, to communicate that visual and auditory elements of that of that picture. Um, so unlike novels, they they do adhere to an industry standard formatting, whereas with some books, they'll be you know formatted in a different way. Um, you know, may present in a different way. Uh, like I said, screenplays are are structured in a specific manner, which is why a lot of people who have never written screenplays before don't whip out a typewriter uh, <laughs> uh, and go at it like Stephen King. Um, they will get screenwriting software. Uh, there are different screenwriting software applications out there, which I'm going to talk about and also give you pricing on. Um, but understand that if you don't have any experience whatsoever, the absolutely worst thing that you can do is open up like Google Docs or Microsoft Word and try and start typing out a screenplay uh, without understanding that format. Um, there are set rules for where scenes take place, for example, exterior, or interior, EXT, INT, um, making sure that those are capitalized. Um, caps um, is very important in screenwriting. Um, you know, sort of case sensitivity is very important in that formatting. Um, time of day, when scenes take place, your actors will expect that, you know, we have a lot of actors in the audience this morning. Um, you know, your actors that you give the screenplay to or the sides to uh, will expect that to be written in a certain way. Um, and, you know, for example, when scenes take place, did it take place five minutes um, after the last scene? Did it take place the next day? Um, software and applications uh, are available, and as I mentioned, now I, I went out there and I wanted to list just three in each category. I didn't want to go crazy. There's a lot more than just the ones I listed, but these are the most common that you'll find. Um, there are desktop versions and then web app versions. I'm a, I'm a cloud SaaS girl. I love everything being in my uh, web browser. I love everything cloud, so I hate installing software. Um, but some of you may be totally old school and be like, damn it, Alyssa, I want to install my screenwriting software. I need a software application. I want to be able to work on it anywhere, whether I have internet access or not, and I need that software GUI sort of uh, graphical user interface. Well, then Final Draft uh, might be a good choice for you. Scrivener is a very common one, and Slugline is actually absolutely free. There's no cost for that you'll notice that final draft is extremely expensive. Um, there, you know, a lot of the software applications out there say, we're the official Hollywood screenwriting software. Um, we are the industry standard. Final draft uh, definitely flies that flag and, you know, as, as being uh, the industry standard for writing uh, screenplays. Um, but, you know, really this is up to your budget and your preference. Uh, it might not make sense to buy Final Draft right now. Maybe you start out with Scrivener, maybe even start out with Slugline. On the web app side, I am a huge card-carrying member of Studio Binder. I love Studio Binder. Now, uh, you do have different plans with web apps, so it's typically a per-user model. Um, you rarely see freemium models on the web app side for, for screenwriting software, but one thing I will tell you is that there are actually two different types of accounts with Studio Binder. Uh, there's the individual accounts and then there's the agency accounts. Because we're a production studio, for example, we have an agency account and those are significantly more expensive than the individual accounts. But if you are an individual screenwriter and you don't have a team and you don't need to use the other features of Studio Binder, um, like the call sheet distribution to distribute call sheets, uh, a lot of the actors uh, who are here this morning watching um, are on the cast of Dark Ops uh, and Ransom um, are, are used to getting call sheets from us from Studio Binder. It'll send a text message, it'll send an email. Uh, so it's a lot more than just screenwriting software. So understand that that's what you're paying for. A uh, Keltex is another one. Uh, this is uh, probably the second most common uh, screenwriting software that I've seen uh, people use uh, on the web app side. Uh, it, it is, again, a little bit more pricier than, say, Writer Duet, which is uh, $14.99 per user per month. But um, I'd say the top two in these ca in this category is around Studio Binder and Keltex. Uh, and then you have Writer Duet, which it starts at about $9.99. All right.
Uh, any questions? No? All right, get your coffee, everyone. Maybe maybe some of you need more coffee. Um, okay, so again, there's sort of this industry uh, established format for writing screenplays. Uh, definitely a page count uh, you know, is important. Um, feature films typically range from 90 to 120 pages. This is a common question. It's probably one of the most commonly Googled search terms as well regarding screenwriting. I think it's up there in like the top 10 is how many um, pages translates to like a 30 minute or a 60 minute TV show or a feature length film. You want to estimate that it's one minute per page. So if you have a 45 page screenplay that typically translates to about 45 minutes of screen time. Um, so just understand that if you're aiming for a feature length film, you're looking at a screenplay that's between 90 to 120 pages. Uh, character names usually always capitalize. You want to make it easy for your cast to be able to pick up a script and immediately identify any dialogue with their names in it. Um, Studio Binder has this awesome feature where it'll automatically tag the cast uh, for us and let them know when they're in a particular scene and it, it numbers the cast. Uh, if you are not using something like Studio Binder, it, it's really important that you make sure that in all of the dialogue in that screenplay, it's typically capitalized for the character name so they can quickly find themselves. Uh, screen headings and transitions, uh, there's a proper format here as well. Again, int, x, location, time of day, transitions, cut to, dissolve to, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then formatting is usually the text is centered in the middle of the page. Uh, here is a screenshot of Top Gun Maverick um, from the Top Gun Maverick screenplay. My favorite movie of all time is Top Gun, that's why I used it. Um, so uh, this is courtesy of No Film School, who has the entire screenplay available for download if you're interested in reading it. Uh, so here you can see this this common format for screenplays uh, being used, and you know you've got your your whether it's inside or outside, so ext or int, uh, carrier, elevator, or airstream. You can get an idea just by looking at that heading where the scene is taking place. Uh, and then the time of day, um, you know, in, in this particular scene on the carrier, uh, it's taking place at dawn, all right? Yes, exactly. There's different transitions. Um, so, you know, it's it just the neat thing about using something like Studio Binder or software is you don't have to memorize all the different cut types. Um, so, you know, just understand that, uh, there are all of these different nuances, idiosyncratic nuances that uh, these software applications help you navigate. Uh, some screenwriters will put additional detail in the script, such as camera movements, uh, lens, focal lengths, uh, et cetera, for the director of photography. Okay, this is a religious debate. Uh, half of the internet will say, no, don't ever do that. Don't ever put that sort of uh, detail in the screenplay. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a bad idea. Don't do it. It's, it's not, um, it, it's not part of the standard format of a screenplay. However, you will see directors being interviewed, um, you know, who famous directors in Hollywood, uh, who will say, you know what, I've had this, uh, screenwriter, uh, or, you know, the famous DPs will say, I've had a screenwriter who knows to put, um, you know, specific camera movements that he or she or they, they want in the uh, particular scene. And, and I appreciate that about the screenwriter. So it really depends on who you're working with. It can help eliminate some additional documentation and work. For example, um, you know, uh, you can probably even completely eliminate a storyboard by providing that level of detail in the screenplay. Um, but again, it, you really want to figure this out uh, with your director, with your DP, specifically your DP or cinematographer um, on what they would expect and if that's even meaningful or helpful to them if you were to do that. Um, result directing is an incredibly bad idea. Uh, I did take directing actors course from Judith Weston um, and she talks about this a lot in her books. 
Uh, and I think it's something that our actors and cast at, at Night Studios appreciate uh, about us is that um, I don't result direct. And this is for the directors in the audience who are wanting to, uh, you know, level up their game on, on directing and capabilities as a director. Um, and uh, this is super important. Actors really never like to be result directed. Awesome. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, um, you know, here's the thing, and, and some of you may know this uh, about Mel and I, is we're transplants from cybersecurity. So uh, we're both executive producers at Night Studios, um, director, she's director of photography, and uh, we made the move in our career from a, you know, two decade plus career in cybersecurity Combined, we have 43 years of experience in cybersecurity and moved into Hollywood. And so it's definitely possible. So I applaud you uh, and, uh, you know, keep going. You know, that's your journey, right? That's your journey. So good. congratulations and keep going. Um, okay, so result directing. Uh, you're probably asking, okay, what is result directing, Alyssa? Result directing is when you're telling an actor how to react to a specific situation. Uh, I've done this, but only on rare occasion and only when I specifically want to see that character do something. Um, and I don't want to give that sort of creative freedom to the actor. Actors hate this, um, but, uh, you know, I have, if you do decide to d result direct, just do it sparingly. Uh, you really want to trust in the creativity, trust in the craft of your cast, of your actors. Um, you never, as a director, really want to result direct. It's a bad idea. And, you know, so an example of this is if you, in your screenplay you write, you know, Maverick begins to cry or Maverick looks sad. Uh, you know, you just don't want to do that. You don't want to tell someone like Tom Cruise or even, you know, a D-list actor. It doesn't matter. Um, you never want to tell them what to do or how to react. Uh, to a particular um, stimulus. All right, so save the cat. Now, uh, uh, this is a screenshot of the save the cat board. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've even gone to great lengths of uh, taking a screenshot of what different boards will look like for save the cat. I kid you not, there are a lot of people out there who in that bottom right hand corner from the photo taken from Glenn Ashton, uh, who who do use physical boards? They don't use software. They will take a cork board. As a matter of fact, the Save the Cat book, um, Blake talks about doing this, where he'll say, you know, or Jamie Nash will say, go to your local Office Max or whatever Staples and buy a cork board and and you know create these swim lanes. Um, I, even though I, I, I'm a Gen Xer, um, you know, I, I just, I do everything in software. I, the, I rarely do anything with physical paper anymore just because it's so difficult to send to people and collaborate on something. Um, this is why, this is why I created the Save the Cat Beat Sheet template in Google Docs because I want to be able to, from anywhere I am, work on that beat sheet. If I've got a cork board, now, Please don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not dissing on anyone who uses a cork board or a whiteboard. But if the cork board is up in my office and I'm visiting my mom in Palm Springs, how am I going to work on that beat sheet if it's on a cork board in my office, right? I'm uh, Mel and I travel a lot. Many of you who know us in the audience, um, we travel a lot, and so because of that. I need to be able to work from anywhere at any time. And so uh, that sort of cloud collaboration makes that possible. All right. So we'll get more into this, but I just wanted to give you a screenshot of what these beats look like. And then let's talk about the actual Save the Cat paradigm. Uh, capture the audience's attention and empathy. Uh, your screenplay should include a moment where the main character does something likable, relatable, or heroic. That is a beat. Um, this is, again, super important, not only just with Save the Cat, 
but really any storytelling. You really want to capture and hold the audience's attention lest you have an audience who comes back and says, you know what, that was incredibly boring to watch. Um, I wasn't emotionally invested. You'll notice this if your audience is all on their cell phones, you know, um, scroll, doom scrolling Instagram or something, uh, you know, that's, you, you were, you failed in, in capturing and holding your audience's attention. And you do these through beats. Uh, establishes a connection between the audience and the protagonist early in that story. So, you know, now with Devin, it doesn't necessarily need to be the opening scene like in Matrix where the first person you see is Neo. Um, but you do want to introduce your protagonist as early as possible. You don't want to introduce your protagonist maybe in the middle of the movie. Um, I, God, I want to say that I, I saw this happen recently in a movie I was watching where... You know, it was like probably 30 to 45 minutes in where I was waiting for a character to show up and they finally showed up. So, you know, it's super important. Again, it's some sort of visceral level. Your audience is going to expect certain things to happen because they grew up in the movies. They're, their very first entertainment, you know, as a family for me was going to the movies, going to the movie theater um, and the circus. But that's a long story. Anyway, um, you know, the the my my happiest fondest memories as a child was going to the movie theater with my sister and my mom and dad dropping us off at the movies. Um, you know, a lot of you probably have a lot of happy memories growing up in the movie theater, and because you grew up on those films, you know, throughout history, have always sort of followed this beat structure uh, that sort of at a subconscious level you just expect now with a movie, which is why you will walk away sometimes from a movie where it didn't follow that structure, didn't follow those beats, and it just felt wrong. But you can't put your finger on it, but subconsciously, it just didn't make sense. Um, some of the essential beats of Save the Cat is really, again, the catalyst, an event that sets the story in motion. This is something that sort of sends the hero onto their journey. Uh, you have the midpoint, uh, which is basically a significant turning point in the story, and then all is lost moment where there's a moment of great despair. Have ever, any of you, I'm sure, like think of a movie, put it in chat. Think of a movie that you can think of where you thought that you saw the hero winning. The he hero was winning the journey, was kicking butt and just, you know, just killing it. Um, and then there's sort of all is lost moment where the hero just loses everything. Everything turns against them, um, their friend turns out to be, you know, two times, you just double crosses the hero, um, you never expected it. Uh, we saw this in Han last night, where, you know, uh, Woody Harrelson and Han, sorry if this is a spoiler for anyone, but double crosses um, Han Solo. And so, you know, it's it's this all is lost moment where the where you think that the hero is going to die. So why the beats? Let's let's talk about this for a minute because I really want to drive this home. And I use this image of um, Mount Everest and the summit of eight thousand eight hundred and fifty meters in the in the sky, twenty nine thousand feet, where you know you have people that are are climbing Mount Everest. They never go from the very bottom of Kumbu Icefall all the way up to the summit in one go. They always stop at individual base camps. Um, so there's the Everest base camp at about 17,000 feet. And then as they get closer to the summit, they there's these camps or these, you know, these uh, stops along the way to make sure they rest, they refuel, uh, they do necessary uh, life supporting measures to be able to make it to the summit of Everest. This is a great analogy um, that I, I, I just thought of where, why the beats in a story are so important. You need to think about the beats in a story is the base camps leading all the way up to the summit of Mount Everest. Okay, so the three acts. Let's talk about act one, uh, the setup, and I realize we are coming to the one hour mark. We are most likely definitely gonna go over um, for those of you who uh, are not able to stay all the way through, this is being recorded and will be available on my YouTube channel. Um, for those of you who can st stick with this, um, uh, it's going to be worth it. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So uh, stick with us. 
All right, act one, the setup. Approximately 25% of the story. Uh, this is uh, the an initial opening scene. Uh, this is where your goal is to hook the audience so they care about the hero's journey and the relationships along the way. Um, you'll see this happen, like, for example, if in, you know, we, want, we love Chicago PD, um, where two of the uh, lead characters will get into a romantic relationship and will get so upset because one of them cheats on the other person or that relationship ends and will just be so viscerally affected and obliterated uh, from this relationship breaking up. Uh, the That is the screenwriters uh, just giving, doing a great job at, at hooking us into that relationship. Um, you, this is where you're going to establish the world. You're introducing the audience to the status quo of the hero's existing life as it exists today. And here you see... And for example, in the Matrix with Neo, um, really not ever making it to work on time, staying up all night hacking and doing things for his clients on his side hustle. Um, that is his world as it is today, where he's just miserable and he can, at, at a subconscious level, feel like there's something more. Uh, then you have your inciting incident, which basically disrupts the protagonist's ordinary world. In this case, this was when uh, Neo runs into Trinity at the club, right? Where she tells him, you're in danger. So danger, Will Robinson, danger, right? This is where the protagonist is um, disrupted in their ordinary, ordinary uh, life. Uh, and then it sets the story in motion. Uh, next is you're establishing the stakes. It's telling the audience what the protagonist hopes to gain or lose if they don't go on this journey. Um, in this case uh, of Matrix, Neo is given the option to take the red or blue pill. If he takes the blue pill, he goes back to his mundane, um, boring life where he's you know, dreading going into work every morning uh, and just is part of the system, right? In Act 2, this is your confrontation. This is approximately half of the story. Uh, the story unfolds and the central conflict takes the center stage. Uh, in this case of Matrix, you've got Neo being hunted by the agents, these sunglass-wearing agents who are out to kill him. Uh, you want to keep your audience engaged with escalating challenges and dilemmas, um, and it's really crucial to have your midpoint twist. Uh, you want to have your your audience not feel like they can expect what's going to happen next. Um, in procedural crime dramas, you have something where maybe the audience. I I love to try and figure out who the who the murderer is or you know who the unsub is, um, and and then getting it wrong, thinking it's one person, then finding out it's someone else. You want to keep your audience on your toes, uh, on their toes. So uh, here you're going to see things like the rising action in Act 2. It's the longest part of the story, and it's characterized uh, by this. The protagonist faces obstacles, encounters conflicts. Uh, the Ring uh, comes to mind, where you know you see uh, Frodo uh, going on his journey and all of the obstacles that he encounters along the way uh, in, uh, with The Ring. All right. Then you have the midpoint, which is a significant turning point. This is that sort of revelation that I mentioned earlier where your protagonist is literally sort of thrown off their axis and their world just sort of abruptly changes. Uh, and it's usually marked by a critical decision by the protagonist. Um, then you run into com uh, complications and obstacles where the protagonist is faced with these challenges that they have to overcome uh, and it tests their resolve. It tests their ability to uh, deal with these challenges. And this is where you see your character grow. Um, in Dark Ops, um, I, I don't want to spoil it too much because we're heading back to set to film the new season. Um, but in Dark Ops, you see, for example, um, we'll see Jeremiah going through this, uh, these challenges and obstacles in his journey where now he's being faced with uh, taking care of his sister and his niece uh, after the death of um, his uh, his nephew who who commits suicide. Um, a lot of spoilers in this live stream, I apologize. Um, but, you know, so you, you see sort of Jeremiah going on this journey uh, as, you know, a, a big brother to his sister who's helping his sister get through this point of her life and, and what Jeremiah is going to be faced with and tackling that and going from this 
you know, um, uh, bachelor who is going on dates every Friday to watching Netflix on the couch with his sister on Friday nights. Um, act three, that's your resolution. That's really tw the other 25% of the story. Uh, your goal in act three is to deliver the emotional payoff uh, to your audience. Again, this is what I talked about where you must deliver what the audience expected to get out of uh, emotionally investing all that time into watching your show or your movie. Uh, this is your climax where the central conflict reaches its peak. Um, in this particular case, um, you know, this could be anything. It could be a person. It could be, um, you know, your, your primary antagonist. It could be uh, some other obstacle or an inanimate object. Uh, it could be anything, but it's that central conflict. Uh, your protagonist confronts the main antagonist or obstacle, and, and uh, the outcome of the story is decided. Um, you have your falling action. It's a period of falling action where loose ends are tied up, your consequences of the climax are explored, and your subplots are resolved. This is where you really are kind of putting a bow on everything that you set up in the first uh, and second act, uh, and then where everything has sort of come to resolution. Uh, then you have your conclusion where Act 3 uh, just concludes by addressing the main questions or conflicts that were posed. Um, this is where Neo has sort of uh, destroyed the agents uh, and and ultimately won and is the hero of the day. All right, so this is a screenshot of Save the Cat. In the top right-hand corner, uh, this is the software. If you're wondering if I paid for Save the Cat software, yes, I did. Um, even though I started out with the worksheet and created the worksheet <laughs> based on all the books, I did decide, you know what? It's not a web app, it's a desktop app, but so uh, I, I, I really love the way it just structure. I'm very OCD, for those of you who know me in the audience. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of obsessive compulsion and I need to have things a certain way. I'm very linear when in my thinking and I love how the software just kind of drives me through that journey. But for those of you who are interested, again, I do have that free template that will be available to you after this live stream. Uh, on the left hand side, this is your uh, what we just discussed about um, the different acts and save the cat. Uh, you have your opening image, your theme stated. This is the setup and then the debate, what Blake Snyder refers to as the debate. Uh, then you have your B story and then your fun and games. The fun and games, uh, for example, with, with the Matrix, this was where Neo uh, was doing the kung fu training with Morpheus, right? Um, where they, he and Trinity were uh, explore, arming up and exploring all of the weapons and guns that they're going to walk into that building with. So uh, then you have your bad guys close in, and then Dark Knight of the Soul, and then you have your finale, and then we'll go into these individual beats now. All right, so here it is, the heart of it all, what you've all been waiting for, the 15 beats. All right, so first... On page one now, I've given you the exact page number where these are supposed to fall. Now, what I want to make abundantly clear to all of you is that these are the 15 beats for a feature film. This is not for a TV show or a TV series. Uh, I will do another video on writing for a TV series or a TV show, but just for those of you who are beginning to write or in the middle of writing your feature film, uh, this is for you. All right, the opening image should fall on page one. This is the very first image or sheen, and it should grab the audience's attention and set the tone for the story. Uh, in this particular uh, opening scene, for example, The Matrix, it's when Neo wakes up on his keyboard, he fell asleep on his keyboard, and then he, you see um, uh, Morpheus or Trinity texting. I can't remember. I think Trinity was on the phone call and Morpheus was the one typing to him. Anyway... Uh, this is the opening image of the movie for Matrix. You get the idea. Next on page five, right, is where you should state your theme. Uh, this is where the character of the situation expresses the thematic message or central idea of the film. In the Matrix, this is when Neo's client tells him he needs to unplug. Her. Now, operative word unplug. Do you remember when he told him that? When he handed him the disc and said, yo, man, you need to unplug. It is a perfect example of this where your state, the stated theme of Matrix is 
unplugging from the matrix. So that's why I love matrix as an analogy for teaching uh, screenwriting because it just falls so perfectly into Say the Cat. Um, okay, so next you have from pages one through 10 is the setup. And, and this really needs to make sure that you conclude the setup at page 10, but introducing the main characters or in your world. This is where you, know, you see Neo just sort of coming into the office on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it shows you their life goals and challenges, uh, and it also introduces other key characters and relationships. Uh, the action sequence that shows Trinity fighting with the agents that demonstrates they are clearly not from this world. Uh, so, you know, in, in the Matrix, you see her flying around. That's not human. That's not something humans can do. So you're setting up this idea for the audience that maybe everything isn't all what it's cracked up to be. Right. You see Trinity doing these things that just defy uh, logic. Uh, so it's it gives you an idea. It's setting up that that this is possibly not a real world. Uh, next is the catalyst, which should fall around page 12. Uh, this is the inciting incident or event or decision that disrupts the protagonist's ordinary day in life. Uh, it really sets the story in motion. This is when uh, Neo meets Trinity at the club and tells him he's in danger. All right. Uh, next is the debate. This is going to be um, actually spread across pages 12 through 25. Uh, and the protagonist grapples with whether or not to pursue the new goal or return to their old life. This is when you see Neo sitting in that big armchair. It kind of looked like this, actually. Sitting in that big armchair with Morpheus, uh, and um, you know Neo's being hunted by the agents, and uh, Morpheus is holding the blue and red pill in front of him. Uh, that's uh, one debate, right? Um, and then there's also the debate of whether or not Neo should go out on the building, right? So... It's interesting to me, one of the things that I need all of you to understand is that there really is no, um, there's really no right or wrong way to do this. So, for example, uh, in The Matrix, they created multiple debates. There were multiple debates throughout this process where initially in the setup, you see Neo deciding whether or not he should go out on the building. And then you have another debate where Neo is trying to figure out whether or not to take the red pill or the blue pill. So something to think about. Um, so for those of you who are wondering, can I have multiple debates? Yes, you can. Uh, all right. So there's break into two, uh, which fall, should fall around page 25. And that's, uh, again, about 25% of the way in your screenplay, your protagonist should commit to their new goal and enter the new world or situation. Uh, this is when Neo takes the red pill and unplugs from the Matrix. Uh, this is where your story just kind of breaks into two. Uh, next is your B story, which should land around page 30. Uh, the B story introduces a second plotline. This is where you'll typically see sort of a, a, a romantic relationship developing between two people. Um, maybe there's not a romance, like a love romance. Maybe it's a bromance between two to men who are just, they develop this friendship uh, along their journey, along the way. I want to say, what was that movie called? I think it was called Grandpa or something, um, where, you know, there's this strained relationship initially, and then they go on this road trip. And throughout the journey of this road trip, they become closer, right? That's definitely a B story. Fun and games, that's your pages 30 through 55, where the protagonist basically is exploring their new world. They're facing their challenges and their experiences, where they develop, where they become a better person, and and you know, they're they're starting to not look like their former selves. Uh, this is when Neo enters that virtual reality with Morpheus and they're they're fighting and they're having these kung fu uh, you know, uh, sparring matches, and they're they're just hanging out, having having a good time. Uh, midpoint, page 55. This is the significant turning point in your story. Uh, it's roughly halfway through your screenplay, uh, which is why they call it the midpoint. Uh, this is a sudden, unexpected turn in the hero's journey. This uh, an, an example of this would be when Neo is told by the Oracle that he's the chosen, that he is not the chosen one. Um, this threw everyone off, right? Do do all of you remember how you felt when you were first watching The Matrix? And the Oracle sitting there telling him, eh, sorry, Neo, you're not who Morpheus thinks you are. You're not the chosen one. 
um, I remember being just floored, right? Um, this is where you're going to just sort of shock the hell out of your audience with some sort of twist. Uh, bad guys close in. This is your pages 55 through 75 where there's consequences uh, for the protagonist getting what they want. Okay, so they've gotten what they want, but there's this sort of unexpected thing where the, the bad guys sort of tighten their grip on their protagonist and throw them off balance. Um, a, a great example, this is when Cypher betrays the team. I don't know if you remember this in Matrix, but... Um, he makes a deal with the agents uh, in order to, for them to be able to capture Morpheus. Uh, next, you've got All is Lost, which is going to fall on page 75. Uh, this is the dire circumstances of your protagonist uh, journey where they lead to inevitable loss. Uh, your character loses uh, something, and uh, basically, uh, it's in, in a lot of stories, it's the mentor, so the, the mentor dies, right? Um, this is when Morpheus is kidnapped and Agent Smith is interrogating him for the location of Zion. Uh, so this loss will typically be felt very deeply by your protagonist. Uh, it's the person that they confide in. Um, what, what's another example? Uh, yeah, uh, My Girl. If any of you saw My Girl, right? Um, when she dies from those bee stings. Um, that, that's another great example of where a, a, a good friend or mentor in, in, in the hero's journey uh, is lost. Uh, Dark Knight of the Soul, this is pages 75 through 85. Uh, this is where the most dire circumstances um, uh, is reached by the character. At this point, the protagonist has lost all hope, uh, which is why Blake called this Dark Knight of the Soul. This is where... Uh, the, the hero feels like just there, there's no coming back from this, right? Uh, it's when Neo and his team come to the tragic realization that they have to unplug Morpheus, uh, ultimately killing Morpheus, right? If he gets done, gets unplugged from the Matrix um, like that. So, you know, this is this is a dire situation where uh, it feels like there there's just no resolution. There's no way to come back from this. Uh in this particular case, maybe Dark Knight of the Soul and Top Gun Part 1 was when Goose dies, right? Um, there's this sort of tragic loss uh, that uh, Maverick experiences that he has to come back from. Uh, break into three, uh, when the protagonist claws around in the dark looking for something useful. Uh, this is when, for example, Neil is reminded of crucial information he learned from the Oracle, which ultimately realizes that he is the chosen one. Um, and there was something that the Oracle said to Neo uh, that made him realize, hey, wait a minute, um, things aren't always all what they're cracked up to be. And the finale, uh, this is your pages 85 through 110. Uh, this is the uh, where Act 3 summarizes uh, and, and comes to its ultimate conclusion, where the protagonist takes on their foes uh, with new tools and new self-discoveries, synthesizing what they've learned in Act 2. Uh, in, in The Matrix, this is where Neo sort of, uh, Neo and Trinity enter that building with all of their guns, and, and Neo puts all this training to the test in order to, to rescue Morpheus. Um, this is where everything he learned through fun and games, uh, and ultimately the midpoint where uh, the, your, your character, your protagonist, takes all that they've learned uh, and, and then just uses it as their weapon, uses it to their advantage to ultimately win the day. And then finally, with your final image on page 110, this is, a, a, along with the opening image, the final image that creates that bookend and encapsulates that journey. Uh, it's, it's really, if you think about uh, books on a shelf, it's the front and the end of the, those books that are holding them in place. Uh, the final image, like I said uh, before, is usually a mirror image of the opening image. Uh, it's the last thing that your audience will see um, that will cement the theme of the film. Uh, so, you know, it's it's you want to make sure that you put all of your creative juices, if you will, into this final image. And it, it's ultimately where your your hero uh, it demonstrates all their ultimate change or transformation uh, that occurred over their journey. So that's it. All of you made it through Save the Cat. Not too bad. We went over about 15 minutes. Uh, here is the QR code that all of you can scan with your mobile phone. Uh, it will take you to the template that I created. 
Uh, you've got uh, a URL as well. If, if you don't have a way to snap this QR code, you can head over to elicitonight.co slash stctv template, and that will take you to the, the Save the Cat template that I created. Now, um, what you'll notice about, notice about this beat sheet template is it was actually the beat sheet template that I created for a different TV series. So that's what I'm all about here on my YouTube channel is using real life tools, real life experiences to help teach all of you. Um, this is the exact beat sheet that I used for developing Dark Ops and Ransom and our different franchises. So while it does not conform to the Save the Cat uh, for film, the original, for feature film. For those of you who want to work on a TV series or work on something episodic, uh, this is for you. Uh, so with that being said, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am going, I've lost my producer. Uh, Mel has gone into another meeting. So I will stop sharing my screen and I will jump over to chat and see if any of you are asking any questions that I can answer for you. Right. Um, so all 15 beats and unfolding in this order, yes. It is, order is super important with Save the Cat. Um, you really want to make sure uh, that, hold on, let me just make sure that I've got everything. Yep, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so you want to make sure that all of these beats fall in the correct order. Uh, they have to go in order and they have to fall on those pages that I mentioned in and around those pages. Again, this is a situation where you might be watching a film or you might be watching a TV show and it just fails to hook you early on in that process. Um, all right, cool. I don't see any other questions or comments. Um, I'll hang around for a few more minutes to see if there's any other questions that come in. Uh, you can ask any question you want, whether it's about Night Studios or our franchises or Save the Cat or screenwriting in general for episodic or for feature films. I'm happy to answer them. Um, so definitely put your questions in the chat and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Devin asks, and if it were a series of episodes versus a feature, would all 15 um, beats show in each episode? Ooh, great question, Devin. Um, there's multiple ways to approach a, a series. Um, it's going to be incredibly difficult. I tried very early on. It's going to be incredibly difficult to get all 15 beats in, for example, a 26-minute episode or a one-hour episode. A one-hour is going to be a hell of a lot easier, obviously, than 26 minutes. But I feel like trying to do that in, in like a 30-minute show, episodic show, uh, you're going to be just taking the audience on too much of a wild sort of ride uh, too quickly where there isn't enough, enough depth each beat um, to be able to try and do that in 26 minutes. Um, but I would definitely say that uh, you can do this over a season. So if you're writing a series uh, for a season long, you, you've got actually completely different beats with Save the Cat Rights for TV and it will be the new, uh, the new show uh, that I do um, that will be specific for writing for TV. And um, so having said that, there is this structure within uh, Save the Cat Rights for TV called a season-long problem. A dude with a season-long problem, actually, is what it's called. And so I have actually adapted that for Dark Ops, where we're not doing all 15 beats in each episode. Uh, we are adapting the, the series to dude with a season-long problem. And so... Uh, I would definitely urge all of you to go grab the Save the Cat book and read it if you want to write for feature or if you want to write for TV, uh, Save the Cat writes for TV. Uh, it will teach you exactly all of the different types of screenplays that you can write. So this, fall, this answers exactly what uh, Devin asked where 
you know, do you have to try and squish all these into a single episode or can you do it over an entire season? So like, for example, uh, we're going into a new season of filming with our co-producers, Tego, uh, and we're actually changing that, uh, the number of episodes to one hour, 10 episodes, uh, which is a pretty traditional uh, length for a season. So it's going to be one hour long, 10 episodes, and so we have the ability to really adapt that to uh, the 15 beats that last over an entire season. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Devin. Um, I don't see any other comments coming in or questions coming in. Steve, good to see you. Matthew, again, thanks for joining us from NBC. And Devin, great, great questions and comments. All right, so thank you so much uh, for joining us today, everybody. It was a lot of fun. Hopefully, all of you learned at least one thing uh, from this live stream. Uh, and again, I will be doing a follow-up uh, show as well on Save the Cat Rights for TV. Uh, and we will also be going more into character development in the following show. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, and we will see you in the next episode of Nightlight. Until then, take care of yourselves and each other.